Hi, I'm Leonard Buttering. I work on Systemd, and yeah, you probably knew that. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk about reinventing home directories. So uh, the, my goal is to take away, uh, like after we took away System 5 init from you, we're now going to take away your home directory. But uh, yeah, I, I think we have good reasons to. Uh, uh, this talk is really about uh, explaining this and uh, explaining why this matters. It's uh, like most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about is this kind of desktop-ish focused. It's not so much server stuff because in server we don't have home directories. But uh, while implementing this, a lot of stuff actually came out for the server as well, but basically as a side effect. So it should even be interesting for server people in some direction. So let's talk a little bit about home, home directories, right? Like dollar home, that's your home directory, um, or tilde. Um, a home directory um, is uh, kind of like on Linux traditionally, or in Unix traditionally, it's a distributed concept, right? Like, first of all, you have your directory in slash home. That's called, like, for my user, it's called Lennart. It's home Lennart. But there's also Etsy, an entry in Etsy pass WD, which actually registered this uh, as a user for the system. Um, I see problems with this. First of all, it needs a writable Etsy, right? Like, whenever a user is added or removed, or he just wants to change his password, we need to make a change to Etsy. I think in, in general, we should probably move to a uh, world where unless there are actually configuration changes made, Etsy can be immutable with only another change. Now, the question is if uh, the existence of a user and his password are actually configuration or just state of a specific user, right? Like, usually, um, if you change something in Etsy, that's a highly privileged operation that changes the configuration of the system. And the, I have doubts that uh, user registrations and user passwords are that. It also mixes, like, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. It mixes state and configuration because suddenly in Etsy we have more than just stuff that is purely configuration because, as mentioned, yeah, I use I don't think it's configuration. Um, there's also this general problem with uh, how we traditionally manage users is that UD, UID assignments, like the numeric um, uh, Unix UID assignments, need to happen at the time the user registers and then they stay stable. And if you ever want to change the home directory, like ch share it between multiple systems, you have to propagate the, the UID as well. That creates massive problems, right? Like it cre creates massive problems with NFS and LDAP and these kind of things. Um, problems that we kind of created ourselves, right? Like maybe because we created this, this concept of UIDs that is small, like its range is too small to be universally um, uh, valid. So it's only valid within some the realm of some company or some organization. And then uh, we created all these massive infrastructure to uh, yeah, um, make sure that my user Leonard and all of Red Hat's deployments always gets the same number. So yeah, I think that the, the concept of UID as a global artifact in a, even though it's inherently not global, is a problem and is something we should address. Also, home directories are generally not encrypted. I mean, sure, there are solutions to do this, um, but it's, the encryption that we usually deploy, like for example, Lux, have full disk encryption or uh, encryption of slash home, it's kind of weird because it actually doesn't cover, there's a mismatch, it doesn't cover the specific user, it covers the whole thing, right? We'll talk a little bit about that later. So at its very core, encryption is not built into the user uh, concept on Linux. And I think we live in a world now like where with all Snowden and all, all these kind of things, where I think, uh, yeah, I mean, my Android phone's better encrypted I think, and, and semantically better to encrypt it than um, uh, my home directory on my uh, laptop, and that's kind of weird. So I think we need to go for a world where every encryption is just there, and there's nothing to think about. So yeah, yeah. as mentioned, it's kind of a mismatch of encryption. By mismatching encryption, I mean that, you know, the way if you install Fedora and do, do hard disk encryption, you get asked during boot for the password of the whole operating system, right? And this is like the passphrase, the Lux passphrase. In this is what protects the operating system as a whole. It's the one password that actually matters. Then after you type that in, the system continues booting up, and then eventually you get asked for your username and password, and suddenly you are authenticated it a second time. But this one doesn't actually matter so much. It doesn't actually unlock any, 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 any cryptographic anything. It just the data is already uh, decrypted. It's just uh, like all the programs can already read it. It just does authentication at that point. So yeah, this, like, I mean, we think that Linux is a multi-user system, but the concept that every user who wants to use our multi-user system has to have a sh same password that he memorizes and shares with everybody else is really plain weird, if you ask me, right? The way I think it should always work is, you as I can authenticate a user, you provide a password for that user, and that unlocks your stuff and no nothing else, and you don't have to share a secret password or anything with anybody else, and um, yeah. 
There's also a problem, um, the way how we do users, generally, like natively, doesn't support anything but passwords, right? There are, admittedly, solutions like, uh, that hook it up with PKCS11 to do YubiKey authentication and whatnot, but these generally are not, you know, you won't find them in Etsy PassWD. They are secondary to that, glued on top in a not very natural way, because, I mean, if you ch make changes to the user, deleted even, all these sidecar databases stay around. It's not extensible, it's kind of the same problem. Right, like since basically 1981, we stayed with the same struct past WD, right? It has a space for a shell, it has a space for a username, a pretty name, UAD and Git, and it's kind of it, right? Since so then, uh, people tried really, really hard to extending that. Like some of things worked out really well, like Etsy Shadow or something, like of an extension of Etsy past WD, and kind of generally accepted. But everybody else added their own stuff in a sidecar database, and most of that it did not get um, adopted universally. So uh, yeah, we have plenty of sidecar databases. Think of Etsy Shadow as the first one. Um, uh, but there's also like the GNOME people came out with accounts demo because they wanted to have a picture with users and a couple of other things. Um, then Samba wanted to share the, like have a per user Windows GUID thing, um, SID or something it's called. But they have another sidecar database. Um, SSH has a sidecar database. It's the authorized keys file in your home directory. It's like all these things are inherently properties of the user, but because our user database is kind of set in stone since 1981, um, it's, shared, it's, it's managed somewhere else, easily gets out of sync. I mean, the infrastructure that we have alone to keep Etsy Shadow and Etsy PassWD in, in sync is already crazy enough, but usually these tools don't get care at all um, what Samba does or SSH does or even Pad Limits does, right? Like, because Pad Limits is how you set said resource limits per, per user, right? Like, and it's a configuration file that's completely separate, even people don't think about that. And there are a couple of other more sidecar databases like that, that yeah, are the messy, different semantics, generally not, not synchronized together. So um, there's also this problem that I think user management, like one key thing next to authentication, these kind of things, should be resource management, right? Like if I log in on my laptop, doesn't matter much, but if you ever live in a multi-user environment, you should be able to control that that user may use this many resources, this much memory, this much CPU, and things like that, and that user a different amount. But uh, yeah, we currently have no sane infrastructure for, for doing that. We have PAM limits. It, it controls resource limits, but these resource limits are like per process, and that makes them pretty much useless. Um, we have infrastructure in the kernel these days, like what the previous talk was about C groups, that would allow us to actually um, do this properly, but we have no sane way to do this right now. This is something I think we should change. I think user management to a massive amount should actually be about resource management. It's kind of sad that we never solved that. So these were the problems that I saw with the current status quo, that it's like, it's lots of stuff um, that we inherited that is deeply established in how we do these things, but it's not pretty and very limiting um, on, on, on what we can do with it. So. Um, everything I'm talking about in the rest of the talk is now about solving these problems. To make this clear, um, with this stuff here, um, I'm focusing on real, on regular users, as opposed to system users, right? This is about me, like Leonard logging into a system. It's not about, I don't know, some, I don't know, Ansible agent logging into something and doing stuff. This is about real users. Like, you, users who have passwords that they type into a keyboard, users that have Yubi keys that they stick into their laptop, right? So, um, if, uh, yeah, there's a primary point. There are a couple of things that then leak into the other kinds of users, the system users, but uh, um, uh, in general, from everything that I'm trying to do here is really about human users, and particularly laptop users, so like um, users that are defined in a, in a world that is inherently mobile, and mobile between um, uh, uh, like organizations. Like for example, my laptop, today I'm using it at the computer science faculty in Brno, but I sometimes use it at the Red Hat office, but I also use it at home, right? This laptop is inherently mobile, and it's conceptually problem saying that it is part of the Red Hat network, because right now it isn't really. Like, I mean, it's part more of the computer science um, department, so. This concept of making a laptop a member of a, I don't know, Kerberos domain or something, and leaving it like that is, I don't know, probably was right in the 90s where laptops weren't the, the, the way how people work, but nowadays I think we need to put a, um, a emphasis on having laptop users, meaning mobile users, meaning laptops that change position, and uh, they're always, 
uh, and were sometimes connected to the internet, but always from different locations. So I formulated a couple of goals that I actually want to do with what I'm doing. Um, one of these things is migratable home directories. Migratable home directories means that I have a home directory on my laptop, and it is uh, all the data that is related to this home directory is unified in this stuff, and then I can just take it as one file and put it onto another laptop, and it should, that should entirely suffice to have the user there. We are not at that world, again, because of all the sidecar databases, right? Like, I, I might be able to tar up my home directory, but that doesn't give me Etsy passw, that doesn't give me Etsy shadow entry, that doesn't give me the Samba entry, that doesn't give me the pen R limits or anything like that. So, for me, migratable home directories is that we unify everything at one place so that this one thing I can then move wherever I want. This has uh, interesting impl uh, implications, like, for, I could copy my home directory then to another host and would just work, but I can also do funny stuff like, I don't know, say that my USB storage stick is now my home directory. And if I plug it into this laptop, I can log onto this laptop and everything's fine. But because all the data is monopolized on the USB stick, I can just rip it out and put it in another laptop and it should just work there, right? This is an interesting application of having migratable home directories. It's not the primary use case I'm going for, but uh, I hope you, you get the gist of, like, if it's truly migratable, this is one of the things you can actually do with them. So, yeah, self-contained home directories. They should have the full description of what the user is, meaning resource management, meaning authentication stuff, all inside of there, so it's, yeah, unified. Um, this means, for example, that, uh, yeah, I have one file object that I can drop into slash home, and this not only means that I have a home directory there, but it synthesizes the user record as well implicitly, and you can, just by doing that, already log in. One of the other goals, I kind of already talked about this earlier, is that UID assignments in my scheme should not necessarily, but ideally, and I think in most users' cases they should be, a local artifact, right? There should be something that, because Linux is the way um, implemented the way it is, um, happens when I log in, I get a UID, but it's not necessarily a global artifact, right? Like if I take the USB stick out of there and put it in another laptop, it should be fine if I get a different UID assigned there because, yeah, I want to turn this into inherently something local that makes sense in the local system and we can remove this necessity to always synchronize it everywhere else. Um, I kind of indicated this already as well. Like, I want the unification of a user password and the encryption key, meaning specifically like the separation where we first unlock the LUX a hard disk, and then much later actually unlock the, 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 the home directory. So we have the separation between encryption and authentication, um, and one is bound to the system and the other one is bound to the, to the user. I want inherently that this all is the same thing. Meaning, if I log in, I provide a password, and this password both controls whether I actually can use that stuff, but also is the actual um, uh, key that is used for decrypting a hard disk. So that one Authentication mechanism is, uh, one, one secret is enough to actually be able to unlock the whole thing. Um, another goal is this should be inherently extensible, right? Like, because the need for the sidecar database that we already had, it's a valid one, right? So if I implement a couple of new properties in, uh, uh, for user record and in the system we contact, it doesn't mean I should be the only one. Everybody should be able to do. Someone should be able to add something. GNOME people should be able to add something. Everybody should have their own fields. It needs to be inherently um, extensible without anyone owning everything and controlling everything and then having a process of, but he adds something, right? Another goal I had is, um, you know, if, I, if you look at how people actually use um, laptops these days, they almost never actually shut them down anymore, right? Like, we, uh, we close the lid, and then they're just bent, right? Like my laptop, for example, I haven't uh, uh, shut down in like, I don't know, a week or something. And I think this is reality, right? Like, but the way we currently use the look stuff, right? Like full disencryption is um, that, yeah, at boot, you provide the password and then stays in memory all the time. It never gets removed again, right? Like it's, it, during system suspend, it's still in RAM somewhere. And this is inherently a problem because it kind of defeats the purpose of, of uh, uh, encrypting everything, because if anybody steals my laptop while it's suspended, it's physically still there, right? Like, if, it's, if, you, if the person who steals it is, is sufficiently technically equipped, like NSA or something, it is not particularly different for them, uh, difficult for them to actually read out the memory, and there you find the unencrypted key for my hard disk. So, accepting that this is how we actually use computers these days, 
I think it is absolutely essential that we remove all crypto keys the instant you suspend the machine. And then we, when you resume the machine, you have to re uh, supply all the authentication keys, meaning your password, basically, and every get, uh, thing gets unlocked. Because then I can be safe if I suspend my, my machine, put it in my backpack, and somebody steals the backpack, it's not useful for them, right? Even if they have the NSA, the key is not available on that system. They can do whatever they want. Um, they have to break the crypto itself. So this was always difficult for us to implement because if you do full disencryption, right, then this basically means that when you go to suspend, you would have to flush this out, and then we come back, but then you have this thing where the operating system runs off the encrypted volume, but now you don't have the crypto keys to access the, uh, the, the, the volume anymore, so you have this problem that unless everything you possibly could need to um, re-authenticate and unlock the thing again, you will deadlock, right? Like because you have to unpage the, the binaries from disk, you have to read them on disk, but you can't because you have to re-authenticate first, but that's exactly what you're trying. So by uh, uh, changing things so that every user gets his own encrypted um, uh, 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 home directory, and that is what we protect, this problem pretty much goes away because the system can stay um, uh, accessible. It doesn't matter anymore because we flush out every home directory. That basically means we need to suspend all the processes that actually access that home directory, but generally we know that these are only the user's processes, it's not the system. So the system stays active and can start programs when it comes back as much as it wants. It's not affected for the, uh, by the fact that the home directories are suspended. Also one of the goals was, um, we live in a world now where, where I, I, you know, passwords kind of work, but also everybody knows that they're risky because usually people uh, have them too simple and things like that. So um, with this, I really wanted to put emphasis on more modern ways of authentication. And this means YubiKeys from day one. And this means YubiKeys in a different way than we traditionally use them, right? Like because um, if you install YubiKey support in Linux right now, what you do get is that they help you with authentication, right? They, what you don't get easily, like I mean you can download some weird scripts and it's madness, um, but what you don't get is that the actual encryption of the hard, uh, hardware is bound to the, to the YubiKey itself. Because that's kind of actually how you want to use the YubiKey. It's a smart card. It, can do, it has a private key on it that can decrypt um, uh, uh, encrypted keys that actually can unlock the hardware, and that's how we actually want to use this. So one of the emphasis is, let's use YubiKey. Let's build this properly so that it's a YubiKey that actually um, provides the key to unlock the hard disk with. And that basically means that, uh, yeah, you get the full protection that you should be getting. Um, by the way, I'm talking a lot, and uh, I know that you have questions, and uh, most people probably have the questions at the end, but actually I prefer it if you have the questions right away. So if you have any doubts, questions about what I'm saying, totally interrupt me. I like it that way. Um, yeah, there are a couple of complications, right? Like if we come to this model, well, we now encrypt the home directories, and you need to authenticate first. You need to provide the password first before, be, before the, the, the home directory can be accessed. This is a problem. Like, for example, for SSH logins, because SSH logins work this way, like the SSH logins that most people use. They work this way that uh, um, you put in your home directory some public keys that can be used for authenticating to your account. And then if you log in from the outside, SSHD looks for these keys in your home directory, and uh, checks if you have the right private key and everything's good and then allows you to go in. But this is systematically incompatible with this model, right? Like because we said it's the password you supply that unlocks the home directory. So that basically means that if SSHD comes along and tries to access the home directory to check if you're allowed to log in, home directory is not accessible as long as nobody provided that passphrase. So it basically means, um, yeah, there's some complications with SSH logins. I don't think it's much of a problem because, as mentioned, I focus on laptop users and SSHing into laptop users is certainly something people do. I do that too when I break my machine, for example. But it's generally, like, usually the laptop is the client, not the server you log into. So, but, uh, I don't know, it's actually not that bad as it sounds even because we actually can make it work to some degree. So basically, as long as the password was supplied once, SSH logins work the way they always work, because if they're supplied once, we can unlock the thing, and then it's unlocked, and then even SSHD can look in, uh, into this. Also, um, I, uh, I actually, like, with this stuff, you can actually embed the, the, the SSH public keys into the user record itself, right? Like, because 
its user credentials should be part of the user record. And if you do that, then actually, um, uh, if you log in via SSH, we can use that information, then SSH can say, okay, everything's good. Um, and then you can get prompted for the password to unlock actually your home directory and then everything goes through. It's, uh, yeah, it's doable. Like there are a couple of things missing because we cannot ask for the password at the time. But anyway, let's not talk about the specific part. It's just saying this is a complication. Um, there's a problem with disk space assignments, right? Like if we give every user his own Lux volume and then you have 10 users on the machine, how do you actually make sure that everybody can use whatever he wants, right? Like because you have the like Lux volumes um, and the way I, I designed this stuff is that Everybody gets a loopback file there that has a Lux volume inside of that, and then has a file system on top. If uh, <coughs> then I have my uh, laptop here, and I'm a single user system, it's fine. I can just size the loopback file to the size of the underlying file system, and everything's good. But as soon as I have uh, multiple users, there's this problem with disk space assignments. I need to figure out somehow, um, yeah, which user gets how much, and then it's relatively static. It's not as bad as it sounds again, because we nowadays live in a world where actually resizing file systems is really simple. It's one ioctal in the kernel you have to call. But it's, I mean, I would be lying if I say it's, it's, it's perfect, because it's kind of a little bit of a volume management that is not as flexible as we want. Like, for example, in XFS, if you use XFS inside of the loopback device, you cannot shrink uh, the XFS volumes. Um, for Butterfans, you can do all, everything uh, dynamically, so we could even, like in a user manager, allow you to drag something and will instantly apply that, so that's all great, but uh, yeah, I'm not saying that it works perfectly, like on a semantical level, but it works good enough. Um, UID assignments, another problem. I talked about this goal of mine that I wanted to make UID assignments a local artifact instead of a global artifact, but that basically means that if I put my USB stick with my home directory in this laptop, I get one UID assigned. If I put another laptop, I might get another UID assigned because the one that I used here was already taken there. But um, I then need to do something about the home directory because all the files in there are still going to be owned by my old user from the first machine. Solution right now is we do recursive churn. Sucks. Doesn't suck as much as people might think because actually churning is really, really fast on Linux. Like with my home directory, which has a couple of system trees, kernel trees, and so on. It's a matter of less than a second actually going through the entire thing and showing it. Ideally, can, can we do this just uh, user namespaces? Good point. So the question was regarding if we can do this with user namespaces. Uh, no, but yes. <laughs> you can do mappings with user namespaces. But so if we do user namespace, that basically means that when the user logs in, we have to set up a user namespace for him, right? Or for, for, for them. Um, but if we do this, um, then this basically means that they live in a sandbox of their own, right? And I don't know, I wanted to have this so good like that I want to use it myself, right? Like I'm writing this for myself, ultimately, right? Um, uh, and locking every user into a sandbox, right, where he lives in this world that is actually separate from the host, right, where he lacks privileges, because user namespaces are mostly about removing privilege, right? doesn't feel right to me. That all said, I think eventually we should come to this mode where users are actually properly, like you can set at least, that users are properly isolated from the rest of the system, right? So that they don't live in the same namespace, not, not in the same file system namespace, not in the same user namespace, not in the same yeah, PIN namespace they probably should live in, but so that they're actually truly um, isolated so we can introduce something where users are truly something that we can have one day and remove the other day, and because we know that the user always lived in a sandbox, we can be sure that nothing remains on the system with the user ID it used at that thing. But yeah, this, this, this gets into the sandbox thing then, and I didn't want to push people right now just to use this into requiring sandboxing for, for all users, because that is another step to breaking Unix um, the way we always have, because right now if you log into Unix, you get access to everything, you live in the namespace, it's everything else. So um, yes, absolutely something we should do better. User namespaces alone um, have uh, too many problems. But I'm looking at like, yeah, maybe next year I'm doing a talk about that, I don't know. Um, I think what, what would be ideal actually for this use case if we would simply, you know, the fat file system has this option where you can specify UID and GID. 
um, and then all the files in there are owned by this UEDN git. It would be awesome if we had that same concept for the other file systems, so that it would just ignore the UID that is stored in the file system. We just, at the moment of mounting, would say, okay, I don't care about user ID uh, ownership on this file system, just make it all belong by Leonard, who's user ID 1005 on this system, and then when you unmount, it's all gone again. So that would be perfect. I don't know if we'll get that. Anyway, that's a question. So, so, yeah, so the question was regarding why not do file-based encryption. So, actually, this project, HomeD, that I'm talking about has a couple of backends. It has a backend, um, the one that I'm trying to push people towards, which is the Lux one that I mostly talk about here. But it actually supports uh, FScript as well. F F F FScript is the thing, like XT4 implements is now, that, which is file uh, system level encryption. Um, EcryptFS, by the way, appears to be dead. Um, so. Ubuntu used them for a while. I think they even kicked it out of the distribution again. But um, I inherently believe that if we protect things with encryption, we do, should do so properly. And uh, FScript doesn't deliver that, right? Like, because FScript um, uh, uh, encrypts the contents of files and the file names, but nothing of the metadata and not the um, directory structure. So if you go into an FScript at home directory, you will see everything that's in there um, except that you kind of not, might not be able to figure out what is what, but you'll still see the sizes, you still see the end times, you still see the ownership, you still see everything else, extended attributes, it's all not encrypted. And that leaks a lot of information, right? Like, that leaks, like, everything that's interesting, right? Like, for example, if I want to know if you have a certain porn movie on your laptop, I could just, like, because it's implicating, right? Um, I could just look at the files that you have there, look at the sizes, and then I know, yeah, larger files become and the less likely it is if it matches exactly byte by byte that it's something else than this, right? So metadata is information, and that's information that we protect. There's also this other problem, that on Linux, file systems are generally not considered to be something like kernel file system implementation that are safe regarding rogue file system images, right? Like the kernel people who work on these file systems generally say, if somebody prepares a file system that claims to be X4, and that is, that is uh, like badly laid out, the kernel people refuse to accept that it's their um, duty to make sure that the kernel doesn't um, like hang or, or, or even stack fault or something like this, right? So, um, I mean, this would be great if they would actually care about this. So, but this means that we need to establish a certain level of trust into the file, like into the encrypted stuff before we unlock it for the user, right? Like, because again, I want to come to this model where you have a USB stick, I can t put it into this laptop, into another laptop, but if we would have the file system at the bottom layer unencrypted, right, and then the encrypted files on top, this basically means I still are able to, to um, uh, exploit the kernel with a corrupted file system as much as I want because there's no authentication step bef done before the file system is accessed. But by pu putting the uh, um, lock stuff below it, I know that yeah, the kernel will only start reading the file system after the authentication happens. So it's a little bit of a protection for me against this problem. So, yeah. Um, FS, but again, HomeD supports FScript, right? Like, if that's your cup of tea, go for it. But I have a suspicion that FScript was, was created for different purposes, like it's a Google thing. And they have the thing, like they use it for basically on the apps level. Every app, like, is my understanding, every app on, on Android uses FScript for its own uh, storage stuff. Um, then it doesn't matter that much that you see the entire metadata. But the way how we do home directories with millions and millions of files, it's too bad to leak that metadata. Um, so I think it's a slightly... Also, Android is really interested, as I understand, that when there's pressure on the disk on Android devices, that they can go through these encrypted um, files and directories and delete stuff. Because that's what you can do with FScript, right? Like, without knowing what what, uh, the, the, any crypto keys, you can actually go there and remove files. And you will never notice, like, if, if you care about this. But even that property alone is something that I think is not okay for our classic Unix um, home directories, because it should not be possible to make modifications just like that uh, without us noticing that. So, um, 
uh, yeah, there was this thing that UIDs, you might have multiple of them. Like, I mean, on Unix, you don't, right? Like, on Unix, the user ID is the kind of the concept, like on Linux. But even that, I'm talking immersively about something that's called HomeD, right? Like, HomeD is an add-on component that you can use if you, if you run systemd, but you can also choose not to use, right? Like, it lives by side by side with classic Unix records, right? I'm not actually taking away classic Unix records for you. If you have a user that was created with classic ID user, by all means, continues to exist, just works fine, right? HomeD can manage users for you, but then you have to create them through HomeD, um, and then there's explicit HomeD users, and we make special restrictions. Like, we make this restriction that a user has a user ID and it's bound to the local system, and it has validity, validity to this. But, yeah, so it's clearly an on component that offers, optionally, a couple of additional users to the system, but does not enforce any restrictions on whatever else you have in there. Right? Uh, So the question is regarding um, uh, putting different containers for each user. I don't know what a container is. A container is many different things, right? Like, an, and a Docker container is a, something about services. So, like, you know, containers about delivery of stuff, which doesn't apply here. It's about sandboxing, which doesn't apply here really easily. Like, we had this discussion earlier, right? Like, um, so I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't know what a container is. I mean, in a way, you can see this as a container, right? Like, because we unify everything that is known about the user and his uh, his resources in one file that you just drop into slash home. So is that a container? Maybe that's a container. Uh, you said that you are uh, trying to uh, data users uh, encrypt. So if you are root, you can change this password and deencrypt someone's files? Yes. Okay, so yeah. So the, the question was regarding um, right now in classic Unix, if if you root, you can change every user's file, including the passwords and like everything. Um, in this world, it's not that way, right? In this world, um, unless the user authenticated, his data is locked, right? Like the system can't do anything. It's basically the moment you type in your password, that is the moment where trust is established, where you as the user trust the system enough to supply your password, and at that moment the system can access it. And when you log out. Uh, I want the strict rule that the passwords are all uh, flushed out again, that the stuff is locked again, and then the system loses access, right? So this is like, you know, um, at the moment of login, yeah, that is really clearly defined in, in my system, where trust is given to the operating system to access my data, right? Like, because we live in a world where we can't trust this stuff anymore, and if I take my USB stick, plug it into another laptop, right, I need to trust the level to a certain degree that it doesn't do bad stuff with my data, and also, that system needs to trust my, my uh, device to not do bad stuff with the, with, with, uh, uh, um, the system, right? So that I clearly define that the moment of login is where this um, trust is established in both directions. But this has interesting implications, by the way, because cron jobs, sorry, because cron jobs generally work without, uh, without being logged in. Like in this model, cron jobs do not exist, because cron jobs basically mean that the system um, runs uh, stuff on your behalf while you're not logged in, while you have not supplied the password ever, right? And this is a model that, I, yeah, I don't think this trust model is, is where we should be going. Like, I want to have my data protected when I'm not like, logged in. I, I want to really be sure that when somebody steals my laptop, there's no stuff running on my data and, and cannot change anything and cannot leak anything. And that means no cron jobs. So, okay, good point. So the, 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 the question regarding uh, uh, was on uh, multi-user systems like where you have centralized, I presume centralized uh, user managed, right? The question is how this re uh, relates to this because uh, people uh, forget their passwords, right? Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, if people forget their passwords, uh, sorry, you have a problem. <laughs> it's the same thing for, 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 I mean, it's always the same problem. Like if you use full disk encryption, you forget the password, I'm sorry. you. It's your problem, right? Like, you, wanna, you can't get this back. The instance we want trust, people need to remember their security credentials. It's not as bad as it sounds, though, because, um, I don't know, the, 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 we need to push people towards you pro providing uh, security credentials 
that they can never forget. Like Windows does the same thing, by the way. So what Windows does actually is if you authenticate you, um, and you bridge this password, they offer you a recovery key. Right? Like recovery key is a, is a second password ultimately, but they generate instead of you typing it in. So it's, this is kind of what we have to do, that we have to, to, to um, like diversify and make sure that that's not just bound to one thing, but you have the recovery key, and then maybe you have the UB key. And if you forget one thing, but yeah. But ultimately, I mean, same thing with your phone. If you, the phones are nowadays encrypted, if you guess your pattern, you're lost. Yeah, I actually have a slide about this. But uh, I don't know, I only got like, like two, like uh, a, a couple of more things to go through. So let's just go on with the slides a bit because I don't have that much time anymore. Um, so uh, HomeD is uh, the big thing that I wanted to go for, and it's kind of uh, laptop focused. But actually, there's all this work and trees two new concepts. One concept is uh, the JSON user record stuff, um, which is the super server NFS, and it's queryable via Varlink interface. Varlink is some local IPC, um, and it's convertible for us and back. And uh, this looks like this. I mean, I'm not going to go through this, but I can, most of it is kind of obvious, but not everything. Like, yeah, does this actually work? Like, username, that's actually the username. Um, last change user is what you think that it is. It's like Unix timestamp was last change. Nice level is, for example, probably that just sets the nice level when you log in. Member of is, uh, yeah, the groups this user shall be part of. And then there's this binding thing. This binding thing is actually that binds a specific user record to the local system. It's something that is retained only on the local system. Um, and that adds a couple of other things. Like, for example, um, in this case, we say that the home directory on this specific system is X4, blah, 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 blah. So it carries a couple of more data. And the most interesting one is this one at the end, because it says, basically, on the system with this machine ID, this user gets the UID 16232, right? So uh, I don't want to get lost in explaining everything here, so we're going to go through this. But yeah, there's also the Etsy shadow information, which is like a, in the privilege section. And there's a cryptographic signature, because um, um, I think it's inherently important to be able to sign user records um, because you want to control which users can log into which machines. And this is particularly important if you do the USB stick thing, actually, because uh, you don't want to allow every random user to plug a stick into your laptop. Or maybe some people do, but uh, most of them probably don't um, and use it. So you want to actually have restrictions on what that is. And that basically means that user records need to be signed so that systems can decide which user records to, to accept and which ones don't. And then there's concept B that we added. That's actually the HomeD thing, right? Like, so that's something where we do the encrypted lock stuff with loopbox files, um, and where basically you have one file called home home. The JSON records, the concept A, is actually embedded in this, including in the file system itself. And that, the, the existence of that just synthesizes you as a fold. This part is managed by system HomeD. So these two concepts are somewhat independent. The second concept, HomeD, um, relies on the first concept, but not the other way around. So if people, um, like if LDAP uh, installations want to be able to make use of the resource management hookups and all these kind of things, like having extensible user records um, and so on, concept A is what they can hook it to. It's explicitly designed to be extensible for them. So first of all, they can provide this uh, user record data, and secondly, they can consume it and uh, um, yeah, it it's can live side by side. The user, like, so yeah, HomeD is one provider of this metadata, um, but it's not supposed to be the only one. And these other subsystems can extend the user records to their taste. Like, I would expect, expect for example, that the Samba people just introduce a SID thing and then that's the thing. Or the SSSD people or the LDAP people do whatever they want. The Kerberos people do whatever they want. And it's explicitly supposed to be extensible. HomeD builds on this and is one provider of these things with very clear semantics, having a couple of backends, but yeah, independent. So how is this all implemented? There's integration with the West. There's PAMP SystemD, which enforces all the settings that you do per session um, from, that is encoded in JSON records. There's SystemD login that enforces everything that is for the user the moment you log in, like all kinds of resource records. And yeah. Um, I'm going to skip over this because I don't have that much time. Uh, because I want to do more questions. Yeah, I already mentioned this briefly. The user records are signed. Um, for me, for like in the HomeD context, I don't consider signing an option. It's mandatory and done by default, right? Um, for all the other providers, it's an option. Like they can figure it out if they want this or not. It's fine. If there's a local service that provides um, user records like this, 
um, it, it doesn't have to sign it because just by having the privilege to make it locally available, that's enough to be able to trust it. Um, yeah, it's mostly about control who can log in where. There's also, by the way, an, a concept of automatic update propagation. So if you have a central system that controls your users, it's capable of generating these user records. You can propagate them on the individual machines, and they get instantiated there. And then you say um, you want to update them from the central thing. It kind of goes to the question that you guys had there. Um, then uh, um, you can basically, the central um, uh, host that originally generated these user records can generate updates, can sign them again. There's a, there's a last change thing to make sure that downgrades aren't possible propagate them to the individual systems, and they're considered updates to the user record. Now, as mentioned before, because the actual data is encrypted with your password, if you actually change the password uh, centrally, we cannot change the password because we don't know it. The way this is handled is then, if you log in, and the user record one says one thing, and the looks data says another thing, you have to authenticate with both passwords. So first of all, you get asked for the, the, the user record, that, like the, the data that's actually in the newer user record, and secondly, you have to supply the password. Then again, it just will just prompt you a second time and say, oh my god, yeah, thank you. You have authenticated against the user, the user record, but now I have to actually set up the Lux device for you. That's a different password. Please supply that, and that's then the previous one. The moment you have done that, we'll actually update the Lux stuff so that for the future ones, you don't have to do this. So there is a scheme how you can centrally do this, but it, it, the, the rule is still, if you forget your Lux password, you can't get it anymore. right? But again, this is like in, 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 in all of this stuff, we try to get away from having a single way to authenticate to having many ways to authenticate, right? This can mean multiple passwords. This can be multiple passwords and multiple recovery keys. It's called all be multiple UV keys and multiple whatever else you want to use. Um, yeah, I mentioned this briefly, PKCS11 support, that's UV key stuff. And what's important is that we do it properly, right? Like we actually use a smart card as a smart card and we derive the full encryption chain from it. Um, how do you use it? There's this home control tool. If you use that, you can create a user, you can activate the user that basically means mounts this home directory to ask you for password or YubiKey. You can resize it, um, which does what you guess it does. It just takes the home directory and changes to three gigabytes. You can just change the password. Um, if you can enroll YubiKeys, all these kind of things. Um, yeah, this is the interface to concept B, home D. But there's also a user interface to concept A, the providing a definition of the user records. That has a different tool, it's called UserDB Control. Um, yeah, you can query user, query group, you can query memberships and a couple of other things. You can query many ways which servers provide this. But yeah, if you are an LDAP user and the LDAP people hook this up with this, this tool would all work for you to query. It's like, like get and pass WD, a little bit more, more modern because it can do the JSON stuff. By the way, I talked to the SSSD people, like to a couple of them actually at this conference and before. And they're actually on board with this, mostly with the JSON stuff. So um, the hookup to the stuff is relatively simple. So hopefully, um, in, a, in a version soon, we'll see that SSSD will actually provide this data for us. And that basically means that from LDAP, you can do resource management then for the first time. And LogND and SystemD will enforce it all for you, which is something we never could. Right? So, but the key takeaway is that these things are separate. UserDB, HomeD. HomeD manages one thing, mostly use case for a laptop, and very independent, very nomadic use case, but the UserDB stuff is generic and is inherently designed so that other providers can hook into this too, in particularly LDAP, SSSD, whatever else. Yeah, uh, this is actually implemented in two different servers, systemd home and user, systemd user BD. Uh, let's skip over this, let's just do questions. Um, Yes, so the question was regarding if, if, if I uh, have a user, uh, um, uh, like, a, like a user home directory, can I declare inside of the metadata on, on, which, users, uh, on which systems you can, you can log in? Yes, you can, but of course uh, the systems are the ones that enforce this, right? But there is actually a mechanism for this. So, so you basically can say, uh, um, like there's a per, me, per machine section in the user record defined. The per, per machine section is keyed by the machine ID. And then you can basically even do stuff like, on this machine, I can log in, um, uh, and I have five megabytes of memory. On this machine, I cannot log in. On that machine, I can say, um, I get this much CPU and things like that. So you, because, I mean, resource management is inherently something specific to a machine, so we need this per machine stuff, but we 
go for it through the whole way. You can even do stuff like, oh, on this machine you can always log in, but at this time, you, like, on that machine you can't between whatever else, but yeah. So the recording was, um, uh, if the encryption is depending on the machine that you're using, you know, um, you, the user record, if you have a user record, just the JSON stuff, you can instantiate it a couple of times if you like, um, and then this basically means that you take the user record and you generate the user directory format, right? You can do it on this laptop, you can do it on that laptop, and on that laptop, but then you have three different loopback files and it's all fine, right? Um, but uh, um, if you actually then take the loopback files, take it from one laptop to another, then, uh, yeah, so those are... Yeah, I mean, the, the security issue we, we always try to address with signing and things like that, because as I mentioned, like, I emphasized this earlier about establishing the trust thing that, that uh, yeah, the home directory needs to authenticate to the system and the system needs to authenticate to the, to the user directory to some degree to make this in, in any way um, workable. So the question was regarding uh, sharing stuff in your home directory uh, with other users um, because, I mean, the UIDs are not stable. So they are actually stable. So the way this is currently implemented because we don't use the user namespace stuff the, 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 and all this kind of stuff is that the moment you log in, uh, we do the choning and we actually leave around on that specific uh, system a binding that says that this specific user, right, has this specific UID and it's never removed again. We can't do this. Like, the remo we cannot remove Unix users at this point because the users can create anything in any file and then uh, these files stay owned by the user ID and then if the user ID gets um, uh, uh, reused somehow, they would gain uh, access to the wrong stuff. So, if uh, the, you have two users and they want to share data, by all means they can do this. They just have to log in once so that they get the user ID assigned, but from then on it's totally stable. <coughs> Again, it's not possible to share files while you're logged in because your stuff is locked down. That all said, one of the things that I actually want to do is like uh, that, um, you know, the lingering feature of login control, right? Like a lingering um, uh, 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 that is implemented in LogInd basically means that the system, like the system D dash user, like the user services actually can start a boot instead of uh, starting only when you uh, activate. And I have this like on my to-do list that we actually, so, like, right now, with the home, way how home, HomeD works, this isn't supported, right? Like, because we cannot start it earlier than your login, because then you wouldn't get access to this. But, you know, we ask for, for passwords, like, for passphrases during boot all the time. Like, for example, if you use full disk encryption, right? So what we could do, basically, is that if you turn on lingering for one specific user, the behavior is like how it always was, that you boot up, and then you get this prompt, like, hmm, user foobar was marked for lingering. Please enter his password to continue booting. Then you type this in, and then it stays running for the whole time without you being locked in. But of course, I mean, the rule is still, unless you provide the password, no access. You think about uh, making the backup of the data? Because if you create your data as another file, and during the 30 days period, if you want to keep all those data, you have 30 different home directories. Mm. So the, the I don't get it. Why do you have 30 different home directories? I don't know, like the way how, like the, the question was regarding backups, how that works. Like, I, I, like you know, it depends how people want to implement backup. Like, for example, they could just do backup on top of it, right? Like, so that it only runs after you authenticate it. But they can also do it below of it, right? Like, because we unify the user in one file, right? Like, it's the most unique thing, by the way, in the world because uh, everything's a file, right? Like, so suddenly the user becomes, becomes a file. You can just take the whole file and make a copy of it. And if the backing file system actually is XFS or ButterFS that supports Reflink, you can do awesome stuff because you can just do a CP that is basically free because it's Reflink, and then the moment actually it changes, only the blocks that actually change get duplicated, like copy and write stuff, right? Well, I mean, so first of all, the user record actually is copied uh, to at least three places. 
the user record reta is retained on the system. That's part because we need to, to pin the UID to the, to the user mapping. It's inside of the home directory in an identity file. I showed this earlier. But it's also third time available um, um, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, encrypted header of the Lux stuff so that we can verify it before we actually mount the file system because of, I mentioned these discussions earlier. So we already keep three um, uh, backups of that stuff for you at different places with different semantics and different lifecycle stuff. Um, if you want to back it a couple of more times, that's totally fine. But the user record actually is retained in unencrypted form on the host system after you logged in once. Does that answer your question? But maybe I didn't understand your question. Yeah. But you know, okay, so the question is regarding like um, uh, file-based backup algorithms. They will see that the entire user uh, uh, loopback file that is there um, uh, uh, changes to change completely, and then you would always do a full backup. So there's this wonderful thing called the rsync algorithm, right? Like everybody here knows rsync, right? What people don't know so much is that the rsync algorithm is actually extremely smart. What rsync does, it actually um, compares um, files um, uh, like when it sees that the m time changed, so that the files superficially changed, right? It goes to the files on the on the source side and on the destination side, like on the on the backup side, um, chunks it up in blocks, compares block by block if these things change, change, and only transfers the stuff that actually changed. It's inherently very compatible with this method of operation because um, if you have the home directory as a whole, right, and then you log in, change a couple of files, you log out, it's only the blocks. Um, of the file system that actually you touch that will have changed. So um, yeah, rsync is your solution there. And I mean, most people probably use it anyway. So it's actually inherently compatible. What about if you change your passcode? Then, then you change uh, the way how it So uh, change the passcode, change the structure of the file? Or is the same so if you except the small or So if you change your password, right? Like, you know, uh, you know how Lux works, right? It has a volume key that actually protects your data. And if you change your password, it, it does never affect the volume key, right? So what you will see changing is the Lux header that is at the front of this home directory file. What you will see change is the identity record that we have in the Lux header as well that is ours, right? Like we extend the Lux header there. What you will also see is that the embedded um, uh, identity record that's on top of the file system will also change. And you will see these three, like you well, basically like if you compare um, uh, the before and after of the block image, you'll see basically changes generally in three areas, which are these three areas. Um, I think my time's pretty much over, but so if we are not being kicked out. Well, it's a, good, it's a very valid question. So <laughs> it depends on policy, ultimately, right? So uh, okay, I'm supposed to repeat the question. So this is actually a follow-up from a question uh, I read uh, from you earlier. Actually. So, so, it's, it's so uh, let, let me repeat the question. So the, the question is regarding, like, if we lock this th thing uh, down so much, uh, what happens if he, uh, he leaves his laptop at the office um, and it's, it's uh, uh, unlocked, if he can then SSH into it? And uh, um, what happens if it's, okay, okay, if okay. it's screen locked? Unlocked. Yeah. But I'm talking about it being locked in one scenario, and the other one, uh, I'm not even logged in. Um, okay. So the, and, and yeah. So the, the the case where you're not locked in, where you are logged in but it's locked, and where it's active. So as you know, yeah, if it's active, you can lock in. If uh, um, you're never logged in, no way. Right. Again, somebody has to provide the password. Right. Then if you have logged in once. Well, well, again, I mentioned this earlier, like with the SSH stuff, what we could do if SSH was nicer to us uh, in a friendly way, that you log in once via SSH, 
um, then it does the SSH authentication, and then we got into control and asked you a second time, so what's actually your, your real password? Then you supply that, then it locks everything. This doesn't work as nice as it works. You can work around this, like for example, by creating a stub user that is classic, right? You log into that first, and then use home control, control activate to provide the real thing, then it unlocks and everything's good, right? But you, I definitely have the intention to make this, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I would really love to fix this problem properly, but we have inherently this problem that you know we use PAM. The PAM hooks. Yeah, I'm mostly out of time. If it's okay, just finish that. Um, uh, so we use this PAM stuff, which allows you to to hook into the authentication phase uh, that happens there. And the PAM thing does not allow us to ask questions after authentication completed, basically. If it did that, then we could make it really, really nice, right? Like then you would SSH into the machine you never logged into, right? Then um, SSH would do its thing, and then you would just see this the next prompt, which is the real password that unlocks our stuff, and then you would never notice it. And then, and then after you activate it once and, and stayed logged in, if you do this again and again and again, the second question will never be asked, but then if you log out completely again, it will be flushed out again, you can be sure of that, and then when you log in then again, you get asked the two questions again, if you follow what I mean. So, but again, we can't technically do this right now because PAM, the way it's used by SSH, doesn't allow us to ask questions at that part time where we actually need it. It's a limitation of SSH in the implementation. It's not, a, it's not, a, not, not impossible to do right, but it would require us to first uh, do a little bit of changes in SSH, which I didn't want to do, but yeah. I don't... Yeah, but the problem with keyboard act interactive only works for authentication, and we need it later. Because the authentication already took place. Like, basically, SSH doesn't do keyboard integration. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, you can turn on the keyboard integration and it works better. But I mean, who uses keyboard interactive on SSH? It kind of defeats the point of SSH, right? Um, so anyway, uh, I don't have any time anymore. If you have further questions, uh, let's do this outside. And uh, thank you very thank much you. for your interest. <laughs> OK.